And hello, everyone. That was another beer opening. Uh, we're back again. I'm Zach. I'm Calvin. All right, and we're going to on to the new topic. So we're going to pretty much segue from what we did before. Um, I think the last episode was probably something about engineering school. We're going to do a complete 180. Well, for me, it's going to be 180. For Calvin is probably going to be a little bit of a 180 from what he talked about before. We're talking about video games. And if you're wondering, well, what about uh, board games or TTRPGs or tabletop games? It's like, well, that's going to be another topic. Right now, we're just going to talk about the good old video games because that's the stuff we always like. So, to start off with, Calvin, what type of games do you like? What type so, of video games? Oh, my God. So, the thing is, like, I, I grew up playing, like, two franchises in particular. Do you want to take a guess? I might have mentioned them to you at some point already. Um, I want to say League. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely no, ever. no, no. At, oh my god, really? I could go on rants about League of Legends. Okay, well, this is what the one's gonna be about. So if it's not League. I'm trying to think because I don't think you were much of an FPS guy, were you? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm trying to think of other ones. Um, you're not a. Well, are you a RuneScape guy? I did play RuneScape, but that's not what I grew up. With. Okay, I'm. I'm gonna give one more guess, and you have to tell me. Um, I want to say, were you a Civ guy? Like a, I have that. Never played a Civ game. Never mind then. Okay, what was it then? <laughs> so the two franchises that I like played to death are well, Pokemon. Okay, yeah. All right, and uh, Fire Emblem. Really, I never got into Fire Emblem that much. Fire Fire Emblem was always one of those things where I always I know it from Smash, and, <laughs> and everyone does, and everyone from Smash Ultimate and from uh, even all the all the other older Smasher games. But I never actually played it. I, I think I've seen some video, videos of it. It's like, it's another, is it like a turn based or is it like an action RPG? It's turn based. It's turn based? Okay. Yeah. So tell me more about Fire Emblem then, and then I'll tell you about mine. <laughs> oh, yeah, because we, we all know Pokemon. I mean, <laughs> we, we hope so. <laughs> I think anyone who's born, even not even born, like anyone who's like at least lived in some sort of media culture in the last 20 or 10 years would have some idea of what Pokemon is. Yeah. Yeah, so so Fire Emblem, oh my god. So it, it the series has gone through a lot of changes since since I started playing the like the the franchise. I think they're on their like 16th or 17th game right now and a new one got announced for this coming February or something like that. Uh but basically, it's a game that is based in a more like medieval fantasy-esque setting where you typically like this is where I talk about tropes and stuff again. Typically, you have this hero that is driven out of their country uh, by some big bad villain that has yet to be revealed. Right? It's just usually some invading empire. And then you, as this like hero, or at least you're supposed to guide this hero and his, little arm, his or her little army to uh, basically reclaim their home, beat the bad guy. And, you know, it's a turn-based game where you control individual units, that character. They all have their own little like skill sets, weapon sets, wep uh, and like uh, stats and stuff like that. And you you take turns with the opponent going back and forth, and yeah, you 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 tactically fight your way through it. So, do you really like turn based RPGs? Is that, is that your go to? Like, if you were to pick a game off the shelf and you didn't know what it was, if you saw that it was at least it was a turn based role playing game, which is kind of what Pokemon sort of is. Yeah. Right. Is that your go to, or is that just like something that you've just grown up with and then? gone out of i guess a bit of both right because uh, uh uh you know how i mentioned that like fire Emblem, like the franchise is like changed a little bit since i first started playing yeah. it so it was originally like oh i want to like feel smart because they the big thing that the original like fire emblems that like i i picked up on it made me feel like uh more immersed in the story and more unique was the idea of permanent death so yeah. what happened was uh, if your character dies, they're dead and you cannot bring them back, right? You're at war, right? People die at war. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like a harsh reality that a lot of war games don't have, all right? And because this individual character you've, you've played with and you've worked with like throughout all the different chapters and parts of the story, right? And you, you've, you've grown an attachment to them. Right, it's it's kind of like the Nuzlocke challenge, right? They're dead after that. Oh, we'll talk about Nuzlocke in yeah, and halfway through. I I have a lot <laughs> more I want to talk about Nuzlocke, but let's keep let's keep on Fire Emblem for now because I'm actually more interested because I never actually played the Fire Emblem games. So I'm curious what what they're about. Yeah, so so it a lot of it is like a really good storytelling that gets you to fall in love with these characters that you know you're trying to like fight through this precarious war with, and if they're dead, they're dead. Okay. And so there's there's a, a lot of like sentimental feeling to it of trying to like. You know, help this hero reclaim his country, 
And I, I enjoyed that a lot, but like the recent fire emblems have changed a lot, so that permadeath isn't really a thing anymore. And it, I don't know, it, it's it's a different feel now. Well, like, so you're saying you do you still enjoy the new games, like both Pokemon and Fire Emblem, or is it like you still, or you just reminisce more about the older style? Uh, oh my god, I, I'll say the games, the new games I've played through, I. Definitely enjoyed less than the older games, and honestly, especially for some of the really new ones, like uh, the most recent ones, like Three Houses or whatever, that got a lot of popularity on Switch, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you told, if it didn't have the Fire Emblem name in the title, you, you, I honestly wouldn't be like surprised if it was a totally different franchise. It's how I feel about Pokemon sometimes as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, my personal favorite. Uh, I guess I'll talk about what I grew up with and what I kind of like now. So. I grew up with the CD games you would get from cereal boxes where it was um, the Lion King pinball kind of arcade game. Um, there was both pinball in it and some other stuff. There was one that was like a mystery one where you had to like figure out who stole something from like a fish reef or something like that. That was kind of fun. And then um, uh, Wheel of... Uh, no, sorry, Wheel of Fortune. Not, uh, it was the... Why am I forgetting the name? It was the one where you have to figure out the phrase. Um, is it Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, it was Wheel of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the older Wheel of Fortune and Treasure Island stuff. It wasn't until I got my first Game Boy Advance that I started playing Pokemon and Mario Kart. So I grew up initially with Nintendo because like, my parents were always like, you, we don't want to get you into M-rated games or anything yeah, like yeah. that. I think Nintendo is like, they, they did the thing right back then because most yeah. people around our age kind of grew up with like the Nintendo games. Yeah. Like, uh, the Game Boy Advance in particular. Well, it was also like one of those games where until it wasn't until like Mortal Kombat started coming around is when like they started people got more and more into M rated games. But at the time, they were still like, you know, it's games were for kids, right? Yeah. Games were for. It's, it's like Super Mario. Mario. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Stuff like that, right? So my parents were always, my parents tried to coddle me a little bit with the uh, video games. Um, my mom more, more specifically. And. She was like always looking at like games that weren't necessarily M rated. Hell, even um, my first teen game was like a Star Fox game, and that kind of freaked me out a little bit. There was one level where um, you had to go on this planet, shoot a bunch of insects, but a couple of them are underground as well. So you had to go into like a little underground area with a cave, and it's just you fighting, right? There's no one else with you, so it's, it was kind of freaky that in that sense. But so I started off with like the Pokemon games, and I sucked at them. By the way, I sucked at Mario Kart. <laughs> I think I probably got good, good at Mario Kart before I got good at Pokemon. And then the big change was when I got a PS3. Ah. I bought it, I think, used or something like that from Best Buy. And my first game I got with it, because all my friends were playing it, was, uh, was Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Oh, of course, COD. <laughs> yeah. Well, I used to, so here's the thing. I used to play Black Ops. Actually, no, no, I didn't play Black Ops. I played uh, either Modern Warfare or the first one on Switch. Sorry, on Wii. Did, on Wii? Holy yeah. crap. Did you not know that? So there was a time where Call of Duty was expanding to the, the, the Nintendo support. And there was World at War, Black Ops, and the first Modern Warfare games on Wii. Wow. And to add on to that, they were also on DS. Huh. I remember it on DS, though. I, I've seen someone try to play it on DS. And man, they have like a singular polygon. <laughs> exactly. It, it was it, exactly like the Wii wasn't that bad. And like, it, luckily, if you play with people on Wii, you only play with people on Wii in general. Right. And it was fun. But I was like, but then I, I was it was an older game and Modern Warfare 2 came out. And everyone was playing Modern Warfare 2 all the time. And I was like, well, crap, I got to get on this. So I saved enough money to buy a PS3. I bought Modern Warfare 2. And then my entire like high school mindset was either call of duty or any sort of first person shooter games that's when i got into battlefield and um what was, oh and then uh, all the sports games like madden nhl whatever oh i got really into that um and we'll talk about sports and how i got into sports in another day but that's basically what was my main introduction into a lot of um those high-end teams because it never really interested me beforehand but yeah i just got really into shooters whether i was good or not i had to look back and check <laughs> but man i i got really really enjoyed them it wasn't until my friend, my friend, uh, his name was, his name's, I'll nickname him D. He came over to me one day. He's like, Zach, you have to check this game out. It's super hard, but super fun. And I'm like, what is it? Dark Souls 2. <laughs> and since then, I've been that type of gamer that wants the game to beat me <laughs> and oh not for God. me to beat the game. And I've been into those games ever since. I think, I think it comes from two different aspects. I, I still, so nowadays, I now have both a Switch and a PS5. And I enjoy, both 
games that the systems have to offer. Um, we haven't bought much games for a PS5. I only bought Elden Ring right now, and I still haven't even touched it because I'm trying to be Dark Souls Remastered at this point. Uh, but I still enjoy the game. I still enjoy playing Battlefield 1. I still enjoy the shooting games. Like, my girlfriend plays Apex a lot, and I enjoy sometimes going on with her and, you know, squatting up, right? Yeah. And stuff like that. I still enjoy that sort of aspect. But sometimes I just want to play a game that, like, it's difficult and it's only one, one hard, hard set to beat. And those are the type of games I've started to enjoy more and more now. I think it's because it comes to the whole idea of I don't want, sometimes I want that mindless fun. Like, I'll go on to this one game called uh, Dead by Daylight. Yeah, yeah. You play it? So it's an asymmetrical horror game. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy that where it requires both a little bit of mindless fun, depending on which role you play, and a little bit of more critical thinking. And then other times I'm like, I want to beat Dark Souls all the way through without using a shield. <laughs> oh my god! Just to prove it to myself. Yeah. So I I never actually got into like the Souls game, but like I definitely know like that feel of trying to play a hard game because like I so I grew up playing a lot of like Pokemon and Fire Emblem and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, shortly after that, I got introduced to StarCraft Two by uh, yeah. uh, a good friend at the time, and uh, I. That's that was my four. I forget what are those type of games called again? The StarCraft type RTS. RTS. Uh, okay, yeah, re re real time strategy. Yeah, it was on type my time. I just couldn't remember it. Yeah, yeah. So I I then played throughout most of high school a lot of StarCraft uh, because it was a game where it's just like, wow, I have to like basically like learn how to play an instrument and like all these different things before I can play the game because it, it, it if you haven't seen all those like crazy like Korean players with like 400 actions per minute kind of thing that that was kind of like the the there was a base hurdle to play the game before you could play against your opponent it was literally the game's going to beat my ass before I can beat my opponent mm -hmm. I enjoy the only closest game I had to real time strategy was the Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle Earth 2. Did you ever hear about that? No. So it was a 2003-2004 game. Same thing. My friend D came over and said, I really like this game. It was only on CD-ROM, and it was basically just a uh, similar to StarCraft. You'd build your area around where you are. You have your enemy around some other area, and you're trying to build up resources and then go and attack them, right, and fight them in that case. And then, um, and I enjoyed it. But I but I got frustrated by it because of how, as you said, how many actions it took. I like a game to beat me, but I like a game where it's a little bit more like I don't have to remember like 15 different keys to try and figure it out. Because I, I was more of a, I guess here's the difference then. I was more of a console guy. I never, except for that uh, one I told you about the Wheel of Fortune stuff and RuneScape, which we're going to talk about soon. But um, but uh, I was never really much of a PC gamer. I was always a console because I was always better on controller controller than on pc no I, I was the exact opposite i like the only consoles that i've ever had were like the handhelds so like a game boy advance or a ds uh but like everything else was on pc ah uh, okay the most i got into pc was when i went to university and i couldn't bring my ps3 with me so i had to go back on pc again and that's why i started looking at more steam stuff so the other real-time strategy game which i guess it really isn't real-time strategy because i can pause it was um what was it called it was a space game and the idea was like you run a, you are running a spaceship with different aliens and different functions of the ship. And the idea is that every time you warp to a different sector, you go to um, you have to potentially deal with a certain situation. It sounds like faster than light. That's what it is. <laughs> I was thinking about the name. It is faster than light. So faster than light. And I was getting really frustrated by the game because I couldn't because I was trying to make quick decisions like in a real time strategy game. Then I realized I could pause it and yeah. make decisions in between the pause. And that's when I really got good at it. <laughs> but uh, that's the thing like that. Like, you know, when it comes to, like stuff like Civ and StarCraft and uh, League and such, where it makes that quick over decision, you have to do quick uh, button button mashing. I wouldn't call it button mashing. I'm going to call it button precision. <laughs> I'll call it button precision. Um, it, it was just like little, it was just like, that's where I got more into that sort of single player stuff. I think that's probably what caused me to do the first transfer over of things um, into a lot of that harder game harder game mode single player modes yeah like the thing is like i i kind of did that transition earlier from the sounds of it right because mm -hmm. you know if you're playing on your game boy advance and it's like a single player turn based you know playing fire mode pokemon or whatever mm -hmm. uh into now it is like esports title you're trying to like beat up the other guy and like you know, we have like all this like hard grind in order to, you know, to play the game mm -hmm. um it, it actually was like a it burnt me out. <laughs> like I, oh, yeah. I learned a lot about like myself, how to improve, and all that stuff. And which is why I'm like playing games was good for me in that sense. But like, I got so burnt out of like challenging things that like I basically retired from difficult games pretty early and just kind of went like, I just want games that have a fun story now. Oh yeah, I, I want that too. But every once in a while, I just want to 
like I want something that's also a little bit challenging. So here's another good example. Um, I, for a while, was trying to get into fighting games. I like the way that they were seen on esports. FTC I, is an animal, man. Hmm? The fighting game community and all this stuff around it, that's, that's a whole that's Exactly. <laughs> so um, on the Switch, I one time down, it was on sale for like, I don't know, like 50% or 30%, like 50% or 70% off. Uh, fighters, fighters, right? So Dragon Ball Fighters. So that's the new, the latest Dragon Ball game besides Xenoverse 2 yeah. that came out that was more like, of the 2D, the, the side-scrolling action game, like, you know, Mortal Kombat, Injustice, yeah, 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 games yeah, like yeah. that, right? I, I think I'm pretty Street sure Fighter. I've seen it. I'm pretty sure I've seen some people play it. Oh, yeah. So I started playing it, and I got destroyed for a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, man, like, because I beat the campaign, and I was trying to beat, I was trying to be good at multiplayer. And I realized, like, man, I sucked, right? It wasn't, and then I was like, and I had, I had this moment where I was thinking, like, okay, if I actually want to be good at this game, I either have to just button mash and hope i win or i actually have to look up tutorials so i looked at a bunch of tutorials uh there's this one youtuber also called adato doya check him out he's really good i think i don't know if he does much fighter stuff now but i think he used to he started doing a lot more Yu Gi Oh stuff which we'll talk about another time um and i was trying to find one of his older videos and he's showing me how to do this button mash and it took i just sat down for like an hour in practice mode and just try to get this one certain combo down and once i got it down my and my the idea of like how everything works um and the fast reaction time and the understanding of different characters, my rank just started skyrocketing about how far I went up to. And if I were to actually go up, pick it up right now, I it wouldn't. I would be able to do combos based on memory alone, based on mu- muscle memory. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to me in StarCraft, right? Because like you start the game, you're like, wow, it takes like forever for you to like build a unit, like a singular fighting unit, because I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know any hot piece or anything. I'm gonna have to be. Right. And like the friend that got me into it was like, Calvin, we've got to play some 2v2s. <laughs> and so I'm just like dead weight, absolute dead weight. And then I was like, okay, it's time. Let's, let's figure this out. And I would spend forever basically in practice modes or in like basically versus like uh, very easy computer opponents or whatever so that they don't mess with me. And I'm just sitting here learning hockey, learning strategies, and putting together like mm-hmm. the game. Yeah. So then I guess here's the question for you, and I guess it'll be for me as well. It's like, what type of game do you, I guess you said that you kind of got burnt out by it, right? But if you were, I guess if you had more time or essentially, like if, if you had the time to play more games in your, in our busy lives and such, and we're a little bit older, so we have a little bit, sometimes we have a little bit less time, so we have a little bit more time, right? Do you prefer a game that is easy to pick up and hard to master? Or do you prefer games where it's like, I need to watch like video tutorials on how to play this game first? Honestly, I don't know. Um, I so what what gets me into games nowadays is when I can really relate to either a certain play style or a certain character or something that like just a, a facet of that game that just feels unique, like an experience that I couldn't have in a different game. Mm-hmm. Right, which is why I, again, like I'm starting to not like the new Fire Emblem stuff as much because they they just don't feel as gripping like the characters, right? Mm-hmm. But like the, one of the last games that I like, the last two games that I, like, poked myself into before, like, not really committing very hard was uh, Overwatch and Valorant. Okay. Right? Because there were just characters in those games that I'm like, wow, this is really fun. I just want to play this character. Right? Mm-hmm. So for Overwatch, it was Genji. Right? The, and, the and, little and, robot ninja guy with the big sword. And, and by the way, we're going to, when we talk about Overwatch, we're going to talk about Overwatch 1, not Overwatch 2. Oh, just for yeah, everyone. yeah, because that, like, shit. Yeah. Right? So uh, Genji. And then for Valorant, it was Chamber. Right? Okay. I just liked his, like, teleporting big sniper like, okay cool okay so okay so i guess you like more like that first person like where you have to work as a team right i guess in that case in no those type of games. You, really you would think so but no because like coming from a starcraft where everything was like it was a hard game but it was like if you put in the time and if you you were legitimately like good you don't have to rely on someone else you're gonna you're if you're it's as honest of a duel as you can get i guess Okay. Between a one-on-one game, but in the other games, like in Overwatch or in Valorant, right? Um, especially when you start like first pick up the game, and you know you don't have any like skill rating or anything, so you get matched up with like other people who have just picked up the game. It it gets a little frustrating trying to like realize that like my role in the team is to do X, but I can't do X unless my teammate does Y, and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, which is the usual like, oh, blame my teammates, but like, man, I don't. I'm trying to just have a fun time right now. I know that if I had grinded a little bit more and like I made up for my teammates in some ways and carry, so to speak, it's possible. Yeah. But I just have, I just, uh, yeah, I'm too burnt out to do that right now. <laughs> that's true. I, you know, that's what really got that kind of mentality is what kind of got me into the battlefield games. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people know is that like I 
and when I say Battlefield, I mean like Battlefield. I played more Battlefield Three, Battlefield Four. And, and when I so what happened was I got into COD relatively early. I was like, oh, I like this sort of like you know first person shooter. Then I rented. So back in a time when you can rent, I think you still can actually rent video games from the library. <laughs> can right? you? I I don't know if you can. I want to. I don't have a library card in my current city to figure to know, and I never really had an reason to because i'm you know i have enough games to play already that's like why do i need to rent a game out for a week if i'm not if i figure i'm not gonna have enough time to actually play it right so i rented battlefield bad company 2 and i was like this game's really fun i can drive in tanks i can be in vehicles cod can't do that i want to play this game so then i bought battlefield 3 for ps3 and i was like oh my god this game's amazing right and battlefield as opposed to call of duty which i think call of duty is trying to do more and more now is they're trying to make the more more a class based system, where I'm. Do you know how Battlefield class system works? No, but I can imagine how because like Overwatch was such a, like a global phenomenon of like this like class based shooter so to speak. Okay. That like they're you can argue that like other companies and other people you know as as it, as yeah. it is when something successfully try to copy it right. Yeah. So I so, can imagine something similar. Okay. Yeah. So I'll say it anyway. There's the medic class, or they kind of merge the medic and the assault into kind of the same thing in the earlier stages, and then later on they kind of differentiate the two. There's the engineer class <laughs> that we like, which is like basically like because Battlefield has vehicles, those vehicles need to be repaired, those vehicles need to have need to be taken down a lot easier. So the engineer class is mainly for that. Then there's support class, which is not what you think it is. Support class is basically I'm gonna go onto infantry and give you all the ammo you need. Because like in Call of Duty, when you had scavenger and stuff like that, you would have to go and pick up a new gun or you have to go and pick up um, ammo with the scavenger perk, right? But in Battlefield, if you didn't have a, if, if you only need some guy who has who's a support class and has the uh, gadget that lets you drop down ammo to people. And then there's the recon class, which is basically the sniper class, right? So between all those four classes, you have a good mix of what you need to do on the field. So there's many times, even when I'm right now playing Battlefield 1 again on PS5, um, I'm in the situations where I want to play Recon, but I know my team needs Assault or Medic. Or I want to or, oh, I want to be Assault, but I'm going to run out of ammo, or people aren't playing in as much, uh, uh, or a lot of people, I'm going to be Assault because everyone's playing Support class. So I'm no, I know I'm going to get ammo wherever I go, so I'm just going to go and be Assault and just throw grenades and stuff like that. So that's what really got me into that sort of like team-based one where you have to do a certain skill. Um, as well as when I think when I got more into uh, Dead by Daylight and I'm trying to think of another game, but I, I can't think of it right now. Where basically like, everyone has to just support some sort of role in the to the idea. Yeah, like I don't, I'm not against that. It's just that for me, when I'm you know burnt out from trying to like get good, so to speak, I just want to like turn my brain off, play this character, or play this like gameplay loop that like I enjoy specific to this. And that's why I don't really play anything competitively anymore. Because like a lot of the titles that I'm talking about are esports, but like I I, I don't play their like competitive modes because mm-hmm. like I I just want to relax a little bit, you know, and yeah. have fun. Every time I I talk to someone about Smash, sometimes like I either get like a I've never played it before, or like yeah I've been to a couple tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with fighters. I one time went. I think I, when I was into fighters a lot, and I got really and I got somewhat good. I was like, I kind of want to try and. Uh, go and face someone in person but i'm like i think they're just gonna whip my ass about it and then it's also gonna be one of those things where um once you get into something like that everyone's gonna try and keep you in there and i'm like i don't want to i'm just here to check it out one time i want and just gonna leave bounce right like it's something that it's not gonna be very that much serious so now here's a question for you then um for so, so we're gonna talk about pokemon because pokemon is one of those weird things where if you go to earlier games they seem difficult as a kid because we didn't know it. But now if you look back on it, it's like, man, how did I not beat this game, right? Because now we have all this meta knowledge. Yeah. So how do you feel about the whole Nuzlocke idea in Pokemon? And do you want to talk about Nuzlocke, what a Nuzlocke is? And then I'll talk sure, about my sure. thoughts on so it as well. Let, let's just like introduce what Nuzlocke is for people who don't know. But like, yeah, so generally speaking, the Pokemon games are fairly easy because they're targeted towards kids. Uh, so Nuzlocke is a set of self-imposed rules to make the game a little bit more challenging. Some people call it the Dark Souls of Pokemon challenges. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't go that far. It's, it's, it's a little bit more challenging, but it's not anything unusual. Some people do consider it, but yes. <laughs> but basically, the idea is, uh, the core of it is, it's permadeath, right? So if you have a Pokemon faint in battle, you cannot use them anymore for the rest of the run. And 
the caveat to that is you can't just catch every Pokemon and then just, you know, throw bodies at the solution either because you can only catch the first Pokemon that you encounter at every new, like, location. Yeah. And I think I think I think Pokemon still do this a lot, where whenever you catch a Pokemon in the summary tab, it'll tell you where you caught it from. Um, I think in previous games it was just for some sort of tracking idea. I think in new games, I don't know if any new games require you require certain evolutions and such to be from this certain area, but either way, that's the idea. It's like that's how you keep track of it. And then the idea as well is that you're supposed to um, nickname every Pokemon so you feel more attached to it. So that way, when you see it go into the red bar, you're not like, oh, I'll just let it faint and revive it later. It's like, no, it might if you if it faints now, you lose it forever. So it creates that permadeath. And the idea is, um, it just make it, do it. That's the basic of a Nuzlocke is that if a Pokemon dies, it's lost forever. You can only catch the first Pokemon every route, and you can and you have to name them to grow a better attachment. And there is a new set of rules. I think we've talked about a bit. It's called the hardcore set of rules. Do you want to talk about what you? Yeah, yeah. So like, there's a bunch of variations to it as well, where like you can you can impose other challenges on top of this, right? So for example, like the hardcore ones, uh, some of them at least. Again, it varies depending on what you want to take on, but. Uh, normally in the Pokemon game, the default setting is that after you knock out your opponent's Pokemon, you can change out immediately. Right. So one of the hardcore settings is to make it so that it is on set mode, so you cannot do that. Yeah. And to get to give everyone an idea, in the first two, ver- very first two generations of Pokemon, there was only set mode. I, I think it was a couple years ago. I replayed Gold again because I had the cartridge, or the original cartridge for it, and I started playing it, and I realized, wait, there's no switch mode. It's just set. That's it. It wasn't until Generation 3 that they introduced the Switch mode. And then since then, they just make it as an option in the settings yeah. to choose which one Some, some other things that people sometimes do is you're not allowed to heal in battle. All right, so you can't use any potion items in battle. That's, that sometimes No, happens. sometimes it's just in general, items are not allowed in battle. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So because here's your thing. You're saying potions. What about X items? That's true. That's another thing, right? right? Where if, <laughs> if you know the game well enough, you can item your way through most battles. Right, so th- there are different like limitations, different rules and stuff, but the general core is it's permadeath, and you can only get so many Pokemon. Yeah, so a lot of people have been arguing that this is what makes the game more fun. And actually, you know what? Recently, I've completed I think three Nuzlocks right now, general Nuzlocks. Uh, sorry, hardcore Nuzlocks, I should say. I think one was general, and the other one was a hardcore. Um, other two were hardcore, and um, they've made the game more fun for me. Like they've re- re- revitalized my enthusiasm into the Pokemon franchise because of this new challenges that come up. Hell, there's even YouTubers that uh have entire channels based on that. There's one channel called Pokemon Challenges. Go check him out. He's a German YouTuber um, who does all this sort of stuff to the nth degree of difficult where he'll have streams where he just says, yeah, if you uh, if you pay this much money, I'm going to kill a Pokemon off my team and still win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I actually didn't get into Nuzlocking until a little bit later. What really like revitalized my interest in Pokemon because like you know you grow up a little bit like ah oh, this is too easy or whatever right mm. uh, it was actually playing competitive ladder oh, okay yeah because right, you so, so, yeah. you paid on like uh, was it Smogon is that what it was called Smogon was like a database or whatever of like how how common and what common sets you would encounter like on certain Pokemon or like what moves they would know and all that stuff but uh, I think the actual like place where you would battle is called Pokemon Showdown I think something like that yeah okay. So then, back to the original question then, do you think Pokemon should have that sort of difficulty level added into their games then? Like, do you think there should be an option that when you first start the game, so here's the best example of it. In Gen 5, Black 2 and White 2, they introduced the three different difficulty options. Yeah, I remember that. There was the, what is it, easy, normal, and challenge yeah. mode, right? And I recently found out this interesting tidbit of information from a YouTuber watched Dude in Nuzlocke and was talking about it, that even though the level cap for all the Pokemon. So in, to give everyone an idea in challenge mode, um, in challenge mode, all the enemy teams, specifically gym leaders, will have one extra Pokemon and they'll have items and they'll typically have, a, I think, a relatively larger level cap, I remember. But apparently, even though the level caps raise, their stats don't change. Oh. Yeah, because I was watching a YouTuber. He was doing a Nuzlocke and I'm going to get into some really nerd, nerd shit right now. <laughs> so um, he was doing a Nuzlocke of like black or white two in challenge mode. And he was in the elite battle against, I forget what the girl's name was. Um, the short one with the purple hair, who was the challenge, who was the champion in gen five. Oh, Iris. Iris, Iris. So she had a, Dr- a Dredagon. Yeah, yeah. And he did some calcs and he was like, and he says, there is a one role that'll kill this Dred- Dredagon. And that's it. He got that role. And he was like, that's crazy. He went back into some calcs and double checked. 
apparently, even though the level cap was raised, the stats didn't change. So when he was doing his original calculation, he was doing it off of a level 60-something Dredagon, because that's what the challenge mode set it at. But in the base game, the normal mode, its level is like 58. Oh. So he was using 60 level stats instead of 58. So because of that, his rolls to kill it were a lot higher. Ah. So he realized that. So apparently he was saying that challenge mode might be actually slightly easier. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Because the level cap is a little bit higher. <laughs> oh my god. Well, I mean, uh, I'm also nerdy, right? But like the Pokemon level is actually in the damage calc too. So even if the stats don't change, a higher level will actually reduce damage from what I remember. Yeah, potentially. But, it does, but if it doesn't change the special attack, attack, defense, and all that, that can be the difference between a killer yeah, for and sure, non-kill. for sure. But it, it is... I don't know. Like, I... So, 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 here's, so, here's, so here's my general question to you. Um... In Pokemon, as you said, it's geared towards kids, right? But we've seen very earlier on, especially in that in the black and white series, right, where they set up the challenge mode. Do you think they should at least have something like that, or do you think, like you know, where maybe you just turn on a switch and all of a sudden there's Nuzlocke rules? So I think programming like a Nuzlocke challenge specifically in it, they'll probably have to name it something else because like they they probably won't give credit to like the original like yeah yeah, thing. yeah. but they'll it, it could be a little bit difficult. I don't know, right? Um, it's because it's not necessarily like uh, a very straightforward. Oh, just this is the rule. Because there's also like different like clauses and stuff as well for like what happens if you get the same Pokemon twice. What happens if uh, whatever whatever this that this right? And so it's a little bit harder to like force into the game, I guess. So I guess from a technical point of view, it might be more pain than it's worth. But I, I would welcome a challenge mode because like even just back in Fire Emblem, right? Where even if in the newer games permadeath isn't enforced, you can turn it on. Yeah, and I think that's the main thing. Is like, I just want an option, right? Because the problem. So here's the main complaint that everyone had with Pokemon right now is that a the national decks. Yeah, I I think sure. it's a little bit of an issue, but which what that that's my own personal opinion. And then the other one was the uh, always on experience share. Oh my god. Yeah, that was the biggest complaint because they introduced it in what Gen six and seven. X Y I believe. X Y yeah, and then. It was made always on in Gen 9, which was... Are we on Gen 9? Sword and Shield, I think, was Gen 9. Isn't isn't that Gen 8? No, Gen 8 was Alola. Oh, my God. Wait, okay, let's figure out. Gen 6 was X and Y, right? Oh, was it? So Sinnoh was... All all I know is up to Sinnoh, because I played a bunch of Sinnoh. So Sinnoh is 4, you know is 5. Kalos is 6, Alola's 7. So So Galar's 8. Galar's 8. Nine is gonna be the new yes. new sword. Is gonna be the new uh whatever it's called, Scarlet and Violet. The, the one with the dinosaurs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so um, uh, so what I was gonna mention was that uh, everyone was compl- so in Gen six through seven, the XP share could be turned on and off. Yeah, it was an option, and everyone was like, "All right, cool." I you know so people can put it on when they want to, put it off when they don't want to, right? But in Gen eight, they made it compulsory. Like you always had to have it on. And so everyone was like, what the hell? Like, it just feels like I'm, it feels like it's too easy. Because, so to give everyone a, the meta of, if you were to play a Pokemon game by itself, the meta was, and I've seen this because I've had my friend do it one time, is that you just use your starter the entire time. Yeah. And you overlevel the crap out of everything. But with this always XP share on, you have no reason to change out your first Pokemon. You just use the first Pokemon at the beginning, then all the other Pokemon in the party just get XP naturally. Yeah. And... And in, in, to give it more preface, in the previous games, you would XP share used to be an item you had to give to a specific Pokemon that would get XP share for that one Pokemon that you gave it to. So when it was turned on all the time, everyone's like, well, you're just making it easier. And I get it because you're for a kid audience, right? But what was the point of not just leaving it on or off? Like, you know, it doesn't change anything. The kid just, if a kid just plays it, they just leave it on. Yeah, they never yeah, think about it again, right? It's just not that hard to just put like an on off switch to it, right? Exactly. But the, the thing is, like, if you if you ask me now when I just want to play like casually, I don't care if it's on. Yeah, I know. And in the casual playthrough, and here here's the other thing. So here's why I got I started playing Nuzlocke because I played through Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Brilliant Diamond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On my Switch, and I was so bored on a general game playthrough because I was like, I'm just using Torterra. I'm just using my favorite Pokemon. I'm not. It's not any sort of good decision making. I'm super over leveled. Then I was like, I'm gonna do a Nuzlocke. I'm going to do a Nuzlocke of this game. And it was the most fun I've had out of the game since because of how I had to use more critical thinking. I had to think about my Pokemon's level caps. I had to figure out how I'm going to grind on and such. It was great. And I really 
you know, as much as I like Pokemon and like I understand how it's not geared towards a person like me in their twenties <laughs> anymore. I just wish that they would have certain games like that where they just add a little, like, you know, add, just add some form of difficulty, not option, but like, you know, say, hey, if you want to make the, you know, add these little clauses into it, like some, um, I guess some computer games, like I'll use the example faster than light, they have an advanced mode and you can turn on certain, turn off and cer- turn on certain things to make the game easier or harder for you. I think that's all you really need. Because I understand Pokemon just geared towards kids, but I mean, you have to understand there's a lot of people who are our age who play it. Who, who like playing it every once in a while, right? uh, it, it depends, right? Like, it, it goes into game design, game theory, and all that stuff, which I, I dabbled into here and there a little bit, too. But the, the, the idea of, like, you must have a challenge isn't necessarily there, right? Because there's other games that can do that for you. Like, if it's just because Pokemon is something that, like, you know, we grew up with. It's the most, like, profitable franchise in the world, I'm sure. It is, yeah. I think it's like the most... I think I, last time I checked, it was, like, the highest grossing media outlet or um ip in the world yeah yeah so it's only because of that that we we want to play the game because we grew up with it right but if we just like rebranded it entirely and now it's a totally different game right uh but functionally the gameplay is exactly the same right you you probably and, and it did have your higher difficulty you probably wouldn't enjoy it as much so it just it really depends on how you want to look at it I guess. I mean, like, I really want to get into these, like, ROM hacks, and if anyone doesn't know what the ROM hack is, it's, like, basically just a modified version of previous games. I think they... Fan-made they, games, basically. They, I think they modify them all the way up to uh, Gen 8, up to Sword and Shield, because anything on the DS and the Game Boy and such is basically easy, easily able to ROM hack, I believe. Yeah, okay, okay. So I, I did get into ROM hacking a little bit myself back in the day, but uh, it's, it's basically, yeah, as, as you said, right, because they were made for, like, older cartridges and like older technology so to speak what we have now is pretty it's pretty good to like get into there and like make a bunch of changes you know to like hack the game so to speak yeah to making it play out differently i mean like look at skyrim right like skyrim the entire reason why skyrim is still popular is because all the mods mods. exactly it's because all the mods right like and i think even um like fallout is the same way um i'm trying to think of another modded game dark souls had a little bit of that but it wasn't terrible it wasn't great um like, that's the whole reason why Bethesda keeps releasing Skyrim all the time, is because they know that their game can just be enhanced, and people just put mods on them anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, again, this this goes into a bit more of, like, you know, who's in charge, who's deciding things. If you, you, you like, dabbled into FGC, so you'll probably know in some way or another that, like, Nintendo really doesn't like when people, like, mess around with Smash. Oh, yeah, so. I think um the, the amount of times that they were, like, freaking canceling um Smash... Like, I think the only way you could play... um. It wasn't Brawl, Melee. It, it, the only way you can play Melee online or anything like that was like through like an emulator. And even then they shut it down. So you only had to play in person. So it's like you, ha- you still ran Melee as a FGC competitive sport up until I think, what, 2020, I think it was? I, I don't even remember anymore. They, they, they recently canceled it. Because I, here's what I remember. So when I was playing FighterZ, I was really into watching the FGC, FGC stuff. So Ultimate and Smash were two separate sections. Yeah, in the fighting competing game current, and at some point they removed melee, yeah, and, and a lot of people have lost their shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It, it, again, it just depends on who's in charge and how they want to deal with their IP, right? Because it's ultimately the, their choice. Yeah, there's a whole reaction thing on YouTube. I think about people when they about melee players realizing that melee wasn't included. Everyone was like, "Oh no, it's you're telling me that a twenty was it? It's, it's probably gonna be twenty years old now." probably it's probably more than that actually yeah it could easily be more than two decades old it could yeah. be about as old as we are so um <laughs> so melee could easily be 20 years old and they're finally removing it from this fighting game community it's like it's about time like smash ultimate does everything anyway so uh also now so i'll bring it to the next question because i was going to segue into the nuzlocke thing, was um how do you feel about video game difficulty settings there's been a lot there's been some talk about it i know um there's uh, one youtuber called the act man he did a video on it I want, it, I want your take on it. Do you think video games should have one difficulty setting, or how do you feel about difficulty sliders? Ooh. Uh, it, de- it depends on which hat I'm putting on. From a technical point of view, it's a pain in the ass. From, from like, a actual, like, how would I enjoy it? Let, let's, yeah, let's talk about just strictly from... We're not talking about technical aspects. We can maybe get into technical aspects of video games, and that would be you and... That'll be another time. That'll be another time. <laughs> let's talk about your general enjoyment and your thoughts on... If you see a game has a difficulty slider, what... They do you feel any different about the game, or do you feel like if you beat it on normal, do you feel any different about playing it afterwards at a different difficulty? It'll it'll depend on the game for sure, right? Like if it's something that is like renowned for its story, 
and I'm gating myself from the story because like I, I set the difficulty slider a little bit too high, then I'm not going to enjoy the game, obviously. Okay. But like generally speaking, I don't mind having a little bit of difficulty to it. I guess it depends on what kind, where that difficulty comes from, right? If it's like I'm required now to, you know, put on my esports pants, learn all these combos and stuff before I can get through the game, maybe not. Mm-hmm. All right. That that that's a uh, again something that I'm just too burnt out on. But like if it's something that is just you know you need to pay a bit more attention to certain points or there's like certain clues that are now gone or stuff like that sure i don't mind in fact it might make it a bit more interesting okay i always enjoy playing my first playthrough on the standard playthrough on whatever the game request like you know sometimes it'll say like this is how the game is meant to be played or sorry excuse me this is how the game is like uh this is what the game is was set originally balanced on and then maybe if i feel like i like it later on i'll be like okay i'm gonna test my limit i'm gonna see how good it, at but that this relies game on having time to play the game twice <laughs> exactly right i mean i know we don't have it but i mean for people who have a lot of more time and who play video games more often right like i don't plan on being a video game youtuber anytime soon like <laughs> i'm still engineer i'm still enjoying my engineering stuff but if at if i do end up having any time to play games i probably want to play at a much more higher difficulty or something like that so i enjoy that especially when it comes to like those turn-based rpgs because usually those don't really have a difficulty slider. So I usually like impose an external See, Fire Emblem does, and they went like extreme in some cases. Really? So how, how did that... So so this, this goes into... So Pokemon is a turn-based RPG that doesn't have one, but Fire Emblem has one built into the game? Some of them do. Well, yes and no, right? So the most recent ones have split it so that it's only like three or four difficulties. Mm-hmm. But back in the day, it went from like easy, normal, hard, then like hard one through five, <laughs> and then like maniac lunatic and something else oh right? my gosh and basically uh it was a lot of stat inflation right so yeah. certain units were just you know they were just a big ball of stats and it, you couldn't one round them so you needed to like team up gang up and but if you did that you exposed yourself and so you would get mobbed whatever whatever right and then as you turn the difficulty up even more what would happen was the enemy would get reinforcement more oh, reinforcement okay. and then on top of that if you, go, if you turn it up even more the turns get reversed so your opponent moves first and then on top of that, it can go even higher so that when the reinforcements spawn, they move immediately. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So I like that part more, more than the stat increases. Because like, if, I, if they just become more, you know, use this um, analogy, like the bullet sponge. Yeah, they basically become, well, I mean, it's bullet sponge, but like at the same time. Oh, no, no, but that, that's what I mean. Like your game, what you're talking about is that half of it is bullet sponge. I think, I think initially just for artificial inflation is they create more bullet sponge yes and yes and no right not, and then, not necessarily in fire emblem because what happens is they become a bullet sponge in the sense that like you run up and you attack them but because it's a grid-based system you are left in an exposed spot and so the enemy can now you know if you're in a bad position because you have to gang up on them yeah you now make the worst tactical decision so that way it's now harder in that sense so it's not necessarily just a bullet sponge but the bullet sponge is like a part of well, yeah, because it felt like it was like the way that you were making it sound like is that it started off with a bullet sponge and then it eventually got to, okay, well, we can't just keep artificially inflating yeah. numbers. We have to actually change the core mechanic of the game, which is what it sounds like. That's what Nuzlocke's do, right? It's like they yeah, change. Sure. Is that they don't, the reason why it's harder is not because they make the enemies harder. It's because they change the core mechanic of the game that says, oh, I can't do this anymore. Well, that sucks. Yeah. Right? So I think for me, I would prefer most of the time anyway, if it's a story-based art game, just have a one, one level, one base set point that everyone can play off of. And then everyone else in their own personal communities can make their own challenges, right? Like, like when I did my Nuzlocke, I didn't do it because I wanted to put it on YouTube or put it on like any sort of thing. I was like, I wanted to prove to myself that, hey, I can do this. And also it made it more fun for me, right? Um, I know we talked about off, off uh, mic, how if in the future we may do a soul link, and that oh, would yeah, that would be, be fun. fun. Yeah. But um I, I but I told you right away, like say I told you right away saying, hey, I want to do a soul link, whether we do it on on a stream or not. Because I think it's just inherently fun for me. And that's why I really enjoyed those uh Dark Souls games. Because it's that it it's those games that create that it just naturally has the built-in difficulty and then the one level set point of everyone who plays this plays at one level and that's it. Rather than having to play campaign on normal standard or whatever because at some point when it gets too easy for me it's like okay I, when i go into the game i don't and i see the difficulty option i'm like i have to sit there like for like five minutes thinking what type of experience i want out of this when the game should just give me the experience right up front and then afterwards change the difficulty on me a bit sure yeah that's the way i kind of like it um going from there so then i guess for video games days because a lot of video games today now if they're not free to play multiplayer games 
if they are some sort of like you know i want to say like some sort of story-based game what do you like like or hate, hate about games that in, in the past like so i guess for example um oh sorry excuse me um in past games there wasn't really much of a difficulty slider yeah right then in like i want to say like around 2000s and 2010s you get a lot of games that had that difficulty slider like you know skyrim fallout sure um all the COD campaigns had that, right? But nowadays, everyone's going more to free to play. Is that some? Is that some? Is some? Like, do you like the way that games are kind of going towards, like how they're going towards that free to play, make as much money off of the well, microtransactions as possible, uh, and then and then and then how like everything's just kind of like one difficulty or everything's multiplayer. So I have a rant about free to play. <laughs> okay, because that's that's, that's that's the term. So here, that's some that new that is. new games are doing now. Because I I don't know if you remember, but I remember a time when um. You know, DLC content was substantial. Yeah, like I would buy. Um, I would. I used to play Call of Duty Black Ops One a lot, and I played the zombies a lot. And I would buy the uh, expand the DLC specifically for the black for the zombie maps. And they would have you know each expansion would have like you know four or five maps plus a zombie map, and it was like fifteen twenty bucks yeah, um, yeah. at the time. And we're talking about Canadian, by the way. So, <laughs> oh my God! Just in case, listen, Canadian listen. Dollar. Some people will be like, "Like that's super expensive." Like, no, we're talking about Canadian. There's a big price difference between Canadian and U.S. Our big, our, our core Canadian dollar. But I mean, exactly. As far as freemium goes, like I originally when it first started like popping its head up, the first time I noticed it actually was when I was playing Fire Emblem, and uh, this was like the transition point when they started like becoming more modern so to speak mm-hmm. where they started introducing these microtransactions and i was like this is dumb like why why do i have to pay like ten dollars through this one map and the worst part was that like unless you wanted to like actually like sit there and spend forever on your decisions to try to map out all the scenarios and stuff you could just like in pokemon over level but in order to get to that over leveling grinding map it was ten dollars oh, and so it was like i either like waste my time or spend ten dollars grind a little bit and move on right and that that was awful and i was like i i will never ever ever like this system but since yeah. everyone's starting to move towards it right and people now rave about oh live service games are like the way of the future or whatever i i, I it depends it no. honestly really depends I, I can see the other side i have talked to a bunch of other people about it but personally i'm more of a believer of like if i want to play this game through and especially because again i'm moving away from like games that are like too challenging because you know i'm I'm old and retired now (laughs) like i'm too burnt out from difficult things i just want to like you know after after my hard work do my do my thing yeah uh, and go through the story like if i pay 20 bucks 30 bucks 40 bucks by the way games are too expensive now too but if i pay like 40 dollars for this game i just want to play through it and i don't want to have to like hiddenly play uh, pay another like 20 30 dollars just to experience the rest of it yeah. Like I, it's a, it's a different audience for sure that like people really like uh, live service or all we are constantly getting updates and stuff. But I don't necessarily agree that that's the best way to do things. I, I think I think live service games are better in main in primary primarily multi, multiplayer games because Even that I disagree. Well, I think I think I think it's an option. I don't think it's like the way of the future because I'm going to use um. Have you so you have you heard of the disastrous launches of Battlefield 2042? No. So that's supposed to be a live service game. It's I think people did actually pay for it like as like a six as a eighty dollar Canadian game, right? And it was a terrible launch. And they're slowly starting to patch the way through it, but like it's just it's not worth it. And the problem is that is I have if you're gonna put a price tag on a game and you still don't you still underdeliver on the content, then you just kind of lost me forever. If it's a free to play game and you're still kind of under delivering, then it's like, okay, well, it's whatever because it's just free to play. I can pick it up, download it, and then not like it, and then just pick, put it down again and not feel any remorse about it. Right? The problem is that, like, when you look at older games like Call of Duty More, Modern Warfare 2 when it first released, that was like a $70 Canadian game, right? And you would get the campaign, which was extensive. You'd get Spec Ops. Did you ever play? You know what Spec Ops is? From? No, I, so, I, I remember. I never okay, played any so of these. Spec so Ops. I played Pokemon and Fire Emblem. Okay, okay, so Spec Ops was actually a co-op, uh, oh, sort of like PVE game where basically you and someone either on your couch or or you know online would join up and you do these different missions that require two people. So like for example, one mission was like you're on a helicopter and you're and some person's sniping from above and the other person's walking through the city trying to get covered from your from the helicopter sniper okay. so it's really fun and then there's multiplayer which had all these different maps right 
and different weapons. And that was a fully complete game right off the bat. And yes, it had bugs and it had different patches as it goes along, but it was like, you know, fully complete. Then you look at games like um, Overwatch 2 or Battlefield 2042, where, excuse me, where you have, um, you get the base game, you buy it, there's no campaign, there's no special side missions, and there's just the multiplayer with like four maps, and that's it. And it doesn't even work properly. That's my problem with like today's game is that they've just gone lazy or the developers have just been so overworked because of the bottom line. Because back in that, I don't want to call, I mean, what do you want to call it? The Renaissance games or whatever the it Renaissance, is. Renaissance, Jesus. Where you had, you had this idea where you know it was a popular market, you know you can get a lot of money from it, but big companies and such were still more about, like it was still being run by people who cared about the art and the um, enjoyability that people will get from your game from your final product. But now it's just become more of a business side of it, right? It, yeah. yeah. It's, idea, it's idea of like, you know, where games used to be somewhat big companies that would do it mainly for the, for the enjoyability of the player. It's now become how much do we sell? Does, yeah. Is it finished? Doesn't matter how much do we sell, <laughs> right? Yeah. There, there's a lot of like examples of that, but it is what it is, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's why I've slowly yeah. started moving yeah. away from like playing games. Yes. Yeah. And like, I'm not, and in terms of like live service, I don't think live service is a terrible thing. I, you know, Dead by Daylight, the game that I enjoy, that's a live service game. They're, they're by a Canadian company based in Quebec. And they, and if you were to buy the game, it's been going on for like five, the game has been around for like five or six years. And the game originally is very, very different from what it is now because it's been live service over time. They added more killers and survivors and such, yeah, right? I, again, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just, it depends on what kind of experience you want. I, I can I can keep ranting about this for days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't think um, I think the problem with the games now is not it's just whether it's free to play single player like Elden Ring or some sort of multiplayer component like uh, like I think Doom Eternal had something like that where you had like both the campaign and multiplayer and such. It just comes down to what level of work and polish you want from the developers in general, right? Like if if I know the developer like. From soft, so from software is the best example, right? It's like they're like the now they're a triple A in uh developer that made a triple A game right off the gate without any need for any excess stuff. And you know what? When they release DLC, if once I play Elden Ring, I'm probably gonna buy that DLC. No yeah. question about it. Because I know it's gonna be complete, I know it's gonna add on to it. I did the same thing for Dark Souls 2. Um, I beat the game, then I heard, then I found out there's a lot of DLC for it. I just started buying the DLC because I very much enjoyed the level of polish they put into it the fun parts about the DLC itself. And it just felt like, it wasn't felt like I was paying extra for it because I got my money's worth out of it. That way I felt anyway, but the extra gear and the extra items and the extra areas that I could explore. Yeah. Um, the biggest insult that I saw was when um, Sword and Shield <laughs> put in the, they removed the national decks, removed oh how the book one. And then how long was it afterwards before they released the uh, Isle of Armor and the other one, the other DLC that added in Pokemon that they took out anyway? Yeah. Oh my God. Like I, like I said, like I, I, I grew up really, really enjoying Fire Emblem Pokemon, but like <laughs> the way the modern games are moving, it's just reinforcing the fact that I, I just, I just don't want to play these games anymore. Yeah, no, I, I get some of that feels. Well. I mean, I still enjoy playing the games. Like I still like, for example, yesterday I played a lot of Dead by Daylight. I still. I am about to trying to complete Dark Souls Remastered um, before I play Elden Ring because I want to. It's just more for myself. It's like I want to beat Dark Souls, know that I beat Dark Souls, and then know that I'm going to be ready for whatever Elden Ring has to offer. As much as I know that Elden Ring's still going to kick my ass. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So um, we're right at the 52 minute mark. Um, I think that's pretty much what I had for gaming, uh, video games. I want to. I guess we'll talk about board games and TTRPGs. I'm a big D and D fan, so we'll have a lot to talk about there as well. But do you have any last comments on uh, video games in general? Man, there's so much more that we could talk about. So much more that I have like a strong opinion of. That honestly, like I'm curious to hear what like you think about it too. Like what the idea behind like meta gaming, uh, more about like the esports and like live service stuff. But you know, let's put that as a next episode idea. <laughs> we'll do yeah. it as like, and we'll do another segue into it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Hope we'll listen again soon.